So the advantage we had was that it was an entirely new space. So what does that mean? There are no defined rules. You can structure these deals however you want. What was great is that you may be a CMO that's been tenured for 20 plus years in the marketing space. And I'm a guy who just came out of college and we know relatively the same about this space. There is no marketing tactic or negotiating power that he can leverage on me because effectively I know just as much, if not more. Welcome back to the Virtual Ventures Podcast, episode 25. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez, and today I'm joined by Simran Sandhu. Simran is the co-founder of Our Future, which was acquired by Morning Brew. Before being acquired, they were able to generate over 900 million views to their brand through all socials. He's also the co-host of the Our Future Podcast, which is an entrepreneurial podcast for young entrepreneurs. Make sure to like and subscribe to help us continue to book amazing guests like Simran. I hope you guys enjoy today's episode. Simi, my man, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on today. I've been looking forward to this episode for a while. How are you? Dude, I'm doing all right. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man, it's been great. You've just been, I don't know why, you've just been popping up on my feed nonstop lately. I see you've been doing some amazing things with our future and all of that good stuff, which we're going to dive into. But the way I like to do it on this show is just dive right in. Tell us a little bit about who Simi is, a little bit of your background, and then we'll start kind of picking through it. Yeah, man. So I've always been interested in building businesses, love kind of having control of my own destiny and that kind of fueled into having this opportunity with our future. So met my co-founder, Michael, on LinkedIn a few years ago. We were really, really good friends. He was doing a podcast series and decided to essentially pivot over to TikTok. And so we joined forces to build what is now our future. So we are the number one business content, business media brand for Gen Z. And then alongside that, we also run a big agency where we work with massive enterprises, think Dropbox, HubSpot, Shopify, and so on. And so recently acquired by Morning Brew. And now Michael and I both have launched our own podcast, which we believe will be the number one business podcast for young founders. You just need to give us to another two to three years. But yeah, man, just excited to continue on with this journey. For sure, man. And I think we should just jump right in. You made a great point there. You guys got acquired by Morning Brew. I remember you had mentioned in a previous podcast that you actually reached out to the Morning Brew team and said that you'd be their chief of staff. That was early on in your career. What was that like? Talk, talk through. Well, I think that came from the fact of knowing what I wanted, but not knowing how, I, how to get there. And so what I ended up doing is I would talk to a lot of other people in similar spots to me. And they said, Simi, you should go be a chief of staff because that gives you direct visibility to a CEO or a person with decision-making authority without having to take their risks. So find a space you like, find someone you admire and go do that. And so I believe I reached out to three people and Austin was one of them just because I really liked the story that Austin and Alex had. They were young guys and effectively created the biggest company in their space. And so just reached out to him in this capacity. And then a few years later, I have effectively done or put myself in a similar position to what I would have been only with a different title, but it's all the same. Now I get to work with Austin, get to learn from him. And it's been an incredible journey and opportunity at the same time. Yeah. And what skills, because I know you said somebody mentioned that that's something that you should be doing. I can already tell that you're very outgoing and I think you'd be a great chief of staff, but in that moment, what skills did you have that thought like, hey, this is a perfect route for me? Candidly, I wouldn't even say I had the skill set. If he'd taken me, I would have been very underqualified. <laughs> what I was betting on was purely potential because I believe that I learned very, very quickly. And so regardless of whatever industry I'd be in, I could pick it up. And my background is in healthcare, funny enough, but I just love media. And to me, it just felt like a simple concept, right? How do you create? good, engaging content that people want to read. And so being a part of that felt simple, easy to understand. And I knew that with enough intensity and just working hard, I could pick it up relatively quickly. Yeah, I, I could definitely relate to you with that. I feel yeah. like I'm the same way. Like I would love, 
I'm somebody like throw me into the wolves. Even if I'm completely underqualified, I can guarantee you that I will figure it out. And I think that's just a great approach. People like that are, because at the end of the day, like when you're scaling a business, you're going to have to wear many different hats and you're probably, well, not probably, you are not going to be the best at every single one. You're probably not going to be the best at 99% of them. You probably have one that you're great at, but you kind of got to roll with the punches. So having that type of personality is super important. And then, like you said, now you're in that point, like you guys, you and your co-founder, I wouldn't say idolized, but wanted to do what the Morning Brew team did go be the best in your space, go build this media powerhouse for Gen Z individuals wanting to get into business. How yeah. do you feel like to be acquired by people like that? Feels surreal. I mean, if you were to ask me that we would be in the position that we are in now three years ago while I was still in my corporate job, Michael was still in school trying to figure out like how to make the most of a podcast. It would have felt like unbelievable. I mean, we both, we're big dreamers and we knew we wanted to take on this space and we knew we wanted to build a big company, but then to actually see it come to fruition is a total different thing. And oftentimes people will ask me like, how do you feel now? Or is it like one of those things where it's just like it, that, that you, you think about a lot and it's like funny because I don't think about it at all. It's just become my new reality. So now I'm still is eager to hustle and and go build something and do the best work I possibly can. You know, you don't see me on a beach in Greece having a <laughs> life. Everybody's in Mykonos right now. I tweeted that yesterday. I'm like, why is everybody in Mykonos this week? But yeah. You know, so what are you doing? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, for you guys, it's amazing. Like I'm, I've been a Morning Brew fan for the longest. Austin, if you end up hearing this, don't pull the receipts because I don't know how long I've been subscribed, but it feels like it's been a while. But I think it's super cool. Like, I love when, because I, I think probably one of the hardest parts of business, at least from my perspective, is finding direction. There's a million different things to do. There's a million different ways to do it. You guys had one concrete thing. I want to build the best news and media agency for Gen Z people interested in business and finance. And then you guys went out and did it and got acquired. I, I want to dive a little deeper into that. Something I like to do is talk about some of the hard times, like when you and your co-founder were kind of going through it, building it from scratch. Let's go to the beginning. I know we, we talked high level here, acquisition. Let's kind of roll it back and then build back up to it. What was it like in the early stages meeting your partner? What were some of the challenges you guys had to face at the beginning? So I had met Michael through LinkedIn. We were both doing our own podcast at the time. I was in the daily news space. He was building out this interview series with C-suite executives. and. Michigan had put out an article about him and I was like, oh, kind of an interesting young kid. And so for the sake of networking, I suppose, I reached out to him and was like, let's just have a conversation. And we ended up being great friends. You know, it was one of those things where we talked a lot just about like, what our goals were, um, ideas we were having, how we were uniquely positioned to take on the space. And one day I would say probably three to six months before I did actually join our future to go build it together, we were thinking about starting a D2C beverage brand called Jet. And so the entire play was that it's going to be the 16 ounce all black coffee and it's going to be like very hustler focused. So think like people who are working 80 hours a week, 90 hours a week, and the branding would play into that. And then we talked to some notable people in the space and they're like, Guys, like a beverage company is like the worst possible space yeah. you can be in. Don't do that. <laughs> like save yourselves. And, you know, I sat there and I was like, okay, well, instead of taking something that I know doesn't work or may not work, why don't we go do something that I know will work? And it was like, all right, let's just pair to turn our heads and go do this together. So that is how we kind of started as to how we approached this from building a company. I think there were three things we had to factor in. First was getting attention. So actually building content that people would want to watch. What made this different is that TikTok was an emerging platform at the time, but there was no business content. And the reason why there was no business content is people who were currently creating effectively just weren't very engaging. So we essentially took the B-roll animations, motion graphics, added the layer of business, which we really enjoyed 
and then just brought it to an emerging platform. And so over the course of that, we were doing tens of millions of views and even a hundred million views a month. Then the challenge was, okay, now that we got something that people want to watch, how do we go make money from this? So then it was building the acuity and the knowledge to go sell this to advertisers. And the big selling point was that brands wanted to be on TikTok but they didn't know how to deploy spend with creators because right now it still felt a lot of gimmicky, people dancing, people like very pop culture-esque. And so yeah. we were the brand safe destination to go reach Gen Z. And then the third thing was ultimately, now how do you go build a team around this and how do you scale? Yeah, one thing, I've watched enough Shark Tank episodes to know that the beverage industry is not great. So <laughs> I'm happy that you guys were able to get some good feedback and pivot yeah. out of that. And then two, I think you just highlighted a great point. I, I think I missed the TikTok boat a little bit just on creating. I had a Discord brand about financial literacy and investing and things of that nature. And we got on TikTok super late. And yeah. I think it was because of my hesitation. I'm like, everybody's just dancing. I can't grasp what people are doing on here. Everything seems very unserious. And I fault myself, I didn't do the homework to go find people like you and your partner who are building things that resonated with me on the platform. So I get what these companies were feeling where if you're just looking from a thousand miles above, it's what, what are people doing on here? I just see the same five or six influencers dancing to cool songs. Like where's the value here? How was negotiating with these bigger companies? How was it interacting with them? What were they looking for from your end? Was it stressful? I've never personally worked with the big Fortune 100, 500 companies. I'd, I'd be interested to learn about that. And I'm sure people listening would too. So the advantage we had was that it was an entirely new space. So what does that mean? There are no defined rules. You can structure these deals however you want. What was great is that you may be a CMO that's been tenured for 20 plus years in the marketing space. And I'm a guy who just came out of college and we know relatively the same about this space. There is no marketing tactic or negotiating power that he can leverage on me because effectively I know just as much, if not more. So with that in mind, what I would try to do in the early days was how can I de-risk this for these brands? I think a lot of people get caught up with just trying to make as much money as possible. And that's what you were seeing at that time was creators would charge through the roof. They wouldn't actually be able to convert and then they couldn't retain these brands. And so in the beginning, what I believed is that we needed to build out as many case studies as possible. And so how do we do that is by de-risking it. So effectively leaning into a performance model, not charging very high retainers. And then once we built up our portfolio of clients, then we can go into more premium pricing. Now, what I'm pitching the brand and what we're actually pricing is now reflective of each other. And so it, I guess it was just having the foresight to recognize these guys don't know it any better than I. So as long as I don't overplay my hand, why can't we build something and make money from it? I, I love that. And I think that's, that's a great way to look at it and just a great way to, to build leverage for yourselves. And I think a common theme on the podcast so far as I interview people every week, it's all of the really successful individuals are willing to build the case studies, willing to put the ownership on themselves and not demand the high money. And then I get people every day DMing me saying, hey, I'll do clips for you or hey, I'll run this and this for you, but this is how much I cost. And my first answer is, you want me to give you money to build my social media when you have 13 followers on Twitter and no profile picture? No. And it's maybe that's the best video editor in the world, but their approach was wrong. Make me five or six clips, present me with some free work that I could look at and be like, wow, that's great. Like, all right, look, let's build together. Let's work on something. But I feel like the people who believe in themselves and actually are putting out a quality product are willing to take that bet on themselves. And all the individuals looking for the shortcut are already like, hey, hands open, like, give me some money. I need money. Like, I see you succeeding. I need to be able to eat off of you, too. And I, I try and highlight it every episode when someone brings it up, because I'm sure that there's people listening who are in that boat that they're like, why are people paying me a bunch of money? Why I've been trying to market this and this niche and like no one wants to help me. Dude, Absolutely. go work for free. <laughs> go work for free or 
do it performance based. Put the pressure on yourself to deliver. And and if you do, then go demand the money, but don't just demand money up front because that's just not that's just not going to work in this day and age. There's too much competition, too many quality people. Individuals with small lean teams are able to scale really big now, so you're competing against so many bigger fish. You've got to have some type of edge. And right now, I think that's being able to put pressure on yourself and maybe deliver some free work or, or cheap work to put yourself out there. So I think it's great that you guys identified that. I would also say where a lot of people who haven't built companies mess up is when they do get someone to deploy spend with them, they get complacent. That's where a performance model is great because it actually forces you to learn. Like if you're yeah. building a company in a space that you don't really have a skill set in just yet, it's best if you are able to put that pressure on yourself to figure it out. I think if someone hits you with a 10K retainer, all you can think about is the money that's come in and just be like, okay, I'm good. We can just chill. And you do just enough to meet the guidelines and then it doesn't really go anywhere. They're not going to renew. And now you're effectively putting yourself in the same spot. So. It's like, hey, I may not make a m bunch of money doing this right now, but if I can build a solid foundation off of this, I know it's going to pay dividends in the future. And I think that's what I would push a lot of young people to think through is through that lens. Yeah, I think that's invaluable advice. And anybody listening should have clipped this part, taken a note, written something down, because I don't think that people, I I've said this multiple times, right. I think that social media has created this fake narrative that it's easy to start a business. <laughs> it's just so wrong. Like it is such a hard thing. Like some people think they can just jump in and be like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur now. Like I create, I build. And it's like, you don't understand the uphill battle that you have in front of you. So I am always quick to highlight, this is the hardest thing you could probably do is build a successful business from the ground up. So make sure you know what you're signing up for because it's not for everybody. We're in this weird time in society where I feel like the pandemic and everybody being at home and starting side hustles, it quickly turned into like people shitting on nine to fives saying, oh, you've got to create, you've got to build. And I'm a huge advocate for it, but it's not for everybody. So make sure that you are like focused and that you actually think it's something you want to do, because if you don't commit to it, it's just going to be another thing that you throw away to the side. So. Something I had for you before we kind of dive into the Our Future podcast and talk a little bit about that. I want to talk about the agency. You recently had written that you signed two of your dream enterprise clients on Twitter. I don't know if you could talk about who those companies are, but what was that experience signing like a dream client? It was a great feeling. And I'll tell you why. Doing a deal with an enterprise company takes a very long time. There are several moments in there where you can get the pitch right, you can get pricing right, you can even be aligned on moving forward. And then for some reason that say the 11th hour, it just doesn't work out, right? Like for some reason or whatever, they're just like, okay, can't, doesn't make sense for us right now, let's revisit. And that is like one of those times where when you hear that, you're like, damn, I just put in so much work to try to make this happen. And so yep. it's actually very rewarding at the end when you do sign that contract to be like, wow, this started like six plus months ago and, you know, I was persistent as hell and I was able to land this big fish and it feels very rewarding. So that's what I enjoy about it. But I definitely think, you know, if you're early, it doesn't make sense to approach the whales until you've kind of built a foundation with the minnows, right? Like you need yeah. to have a lot of small case studies. You need to be able to flush out what it is you're doing before you go and have that big opportunity because you want to make sure you're prepared, right? What ends up happening is that say for some reason, maybe you get a warm, it, warm intro into one of these bigger companies and they do give you a chance. And if you don't do a good job, well, now you've closed that door forever. And those are the people who actually have really deep pockets. Like candidly, one big company as a client could probably pay you for the rest of the year, right? Like that is the kind of deal that you know, you're secure. So you just want to make sure you're able to put yourself in a position where you can really take advantage of that when those opportunities come. Yeah. And my nine to five, I, I primarily sell into fortune 100 companies. So, yeah. and the product that I sell typically has an eight to nine month sales cycle. 
So I'm very familiar with what it's like to work really hard. And then at the last minute, be like, oh, we reevaluated the budget and this is maybe something for next fiscal. And it's yeah. like, oh man, like shot to the heart. Yeah. So I totally get that. And I think it's good that people like hear this from you, somebody who has built the agency from the ground up, been successful, because I know everybody's just like, obviously it's cool. Like you want to go sign a big client. Like you want to go get exposed to, to something like this. So people just kind of dive in. And so I think it's great that you're highlighting that. And I think people really need to set some realistic expectations when they go into things like this. Before we jump over to the podcast side of things, one more agency question. You were able to work with Start Engine and Mr. Wonderful. I, I like Mr. Wonderful, Miami. Were you, ever to, were you able to work with him directly? Was it with his team? How was that experience? Yeah, mostly with his team, right? With any bigger name client, you're not working with them one-on-one. -on -one. I guess what I take satisfaction in knowing is that anything that I script or my team scripts goes to him directly and he has to follow the, the guidance to then go build the video. So a message is getting to him one way or another, even though it's yep. not necessarily direct. But yeah, they're, this, they're a phenomenal client, love working with them. And I think it's like one of those things too, where our relationship has expanded and scaled quite a bit from like the initial days. And so what I would also encourage others to think about is just finding your entry point. Like you don't have to throw the full book at people of services that you may offer. Just find that one little thing, do good work, and then you can scale out in the future. So love starting They're They're one of my favorite clients and love having a small role to play in Mr. Wonderful's popularity on TikTok, I suppose. That's awesome. And yeah. the last thing before we jump into the other half of your journey is agency businesses are so popular right now. Everybody's starting them. Everybody's getting in. The space is getting extremely competitive. If you were starting an agency from day one, what were some of the things you would do? And if there's somebody listening right now who's on the fence or just started their journey, what kind of tips and advice would you give them? So one approach I've seen others take, and I think it's really smart, is they go, t take, for example, any company you admire, right? And go look at their P&L or their balance sheet and figure out where they're spending the most money, where are their biggest expenses? And then go start an agency on that, on that line of thinking, right? So let's assume they're spending X amount on accounting work or let me give you a better example. We can cut this part out. Let's assume they're spending X amount on SEO, right? And it's like, okay, well, I know that there's a big opportunity because they're deploying it much as much as this. They're deploying this much spend. And I know other companies in this industry are probably deploying just as much. And so this is who I should target because there's demand for this. There's actual expenditure and I can equate it to dollars and cents. Then what I would do is try to do it as simply free work. So not even pitching them just yet, trying to build it on your own or finding other folks, ICs who can come in and help you build those things. And so then you just want to test it out and make sure that it actually does what it needs to do. And then you can go pitch the client and be like, hey, you know, I just created this free website for you. It's already getting a lot of traction, a lot of attention. You know, if this is interesting, I'd love to talk about, you know, working with you in some capacity. And then I think taking that approach would say three or four other companies to just do free work for them. And then I think from there on, you can scale out. So now it's okay. Now we have case studies. Now we know what we're doing. Okay. Then I think it's just still operating lean. Now you go get more clients. And then as you go, you build on a team. What you don't want to do is like you start hiring a bunch of people before you actually need them, because not only are you going to increase your brain significantly, but I think it, it instills bad habits because if you can't make up in terms of the work, then you're going to have to, you know, lay these people off. And that's just not a fun experience either. So it, it's, it's a funny thing because every single young person I've talked to has overhired at one point. Like, and I think it's a little bit has to do with the fact that it's kind of messed up how we look at, you know, these indicators of success. For a while there, it was, hey, I have 50 people who work underneath me. I have 25, I have 30 people who work underneath me. And now I've come to realize that's actually not that cool, right? Like all yeah. that is you're spending a lot of money. So yeah, man, do the free work. And then as you go, you learn, you'll scale and just give it enough time. 
Yeah, for sure. And I think it's great. Like another highlight, take ownership of what you're doing, put the pressure on yourself and don't expect everything from the brands you're working with. And then two, I've overhired. I think it's a very common thing. It's really cool to have a bunch of employees and think you're the boss. But, and I I think the trend is definitely coming in now. Having a lean team is now cool. Being able to say that you did X revenue with three to four people, that's what's cool. So I think we're headed in the right direction from that standpoint, because it used to be like, oh, I've got 30, 40 people under me. Like, look at me. And it's like, do you even know what those 30, 40 people actually do? Well, yeah, man. And what's interesting to me is we're still so focused on top line and the sound's so simple, but take two different scenarios, right? A 50K agency where you're doing 80% margins or a 100K agency, a 100K a month agency where you're doing 30, 35% margins. Which one are you actually making more money from? Sure, the 100K sounds more flashier, but you're waking way more with, you know, the 80% margin lower revenue agency and so i just kept think we get caught up in these like flashy signals and it's actually not the best business decision you're not actually optimizing for money and i actually think that if you're doing it so just to show off or you know i get it like if you want to go build a seven-figure business and in your mind that is what you're optimizing for is i want to build something that does over a million dollars a year that makes a lot of sense But I just think that like that's sometimes not the best optimized decision if you know you can make more money by doing less in revenue because you personally can handle that bandwidth and you have a much higher profit margin. So, you know, it it depends on what you want. Some people may not give a shit and they're like, you know, it's cool or still making good money, but that million dollar figure, that seven figure number makes me feel better. It makes Mm -hmm. me feel more confident. And so I guess if that's what you're optimizing for, then so be it. But it's just kind of an interesting thing that I've seen take place so many times now and what I would encourage others to think about too. Awesome. Shifting gears towards the podcast journey and experience that you had. I know you said that before you and your partner met, you had um, a news podcast I have here. You recorded over 300 episodes, which is extremely impressive, especially now that I'm doing this. <laughs> I can I can look at you and be really impressed with that number. What was that like? Like, what was it like to record 300 episodes? At what point did you start to think like, oh, shit, this is picking up like we're headed in the right direction? Because I know that it was probably a little bit of a journey there. Dude, it was a grind. (laughs) It was I didn't realize how much work it was going to be until I actually just threw myself in there. And then what I thought about it when I was thinking about it, then my entire goal was I'm just going to do enough episodes where it feels like a sunk cost. Like I've just done too much to give up now. And so I love that approach. Yeah, I did it for about three weeks and I was like, well, you know, I'm 15 plus episodes in. I've essentially promoted the shit out of this thing. Like I put it on all my socials. Everybody knows I'm working on this, at least in my immediate circle. I can't stop now to keep going. But there were definitely some stressful times. And it's funny because it was just like a daily news podcast. Like it wasn't like I had huge listenership until actually the, the later stages. But, you know, I'd get off from work around 5.30 p.m. I would then hang out for maybe two to three hours. And then usually from like 8.30 to 2 on a good night, but even as late as like 3.30 in the morning, I'd be working on this pod. So it'd be like three or four hours of researching and scripting another 30 minutes of actually then recording and then another two hours in post-production work. And then it's like, say, 3 a.m. at this time and 8 a.m. I'm back at the office. And I was like, this I was on this Ferris wheel where I was like, dude, put myself through hell. <laughs> For what? <laughs> like, this isn't actually growing in the way that I wanted. And so I still believe it was the right idea. It was just the wrong medium to go do it in. And then you said... Michael, your business partner, was doing a podcast as well, but pivoted to TikTok. At what point did you realize that both of you, like, let's combine what we're already doing, what we're already building, and let's go see that bigger picture? Like, at what point in that journey did that happen? I think it was when we had already decided to work together on this D2C brand. And so there was this small mental signal, I suppose, where it was like, okay, we've already agreed to work together in some way, shape or form. 
So it's not that far removed where we can just work together on our future because that was already working. There was already some grand value there and there was already a solid foundation. And so, you know, what I wanted to do in the new space, take it across several different verticals, our future was actually trying to go do these things. And so we could create business verticals in a bunch of different niches. And so, yeah, man, I think it was just deciding we like each other enough to wanting to work together and then just being aligned on what it is we were going to work together on. I have written down here that in one of your other, like a podcast that you went on, it might've been the Danny Miranda show. You mentioned that you built you the first video for our future finance got like 17,000 views. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think that you guys cracked the code right off the bat? Did you, yeah, what, what was that? It was 750k views and it was oh, whoa 750k views so yeah, bad listening for me yeah, made one extremely viral and it was insane because we had never had a video but i oh. drive bring in seventeen thousand followers Seventeen thousand followers is what i have written down here all right <laughs> yeah and it was just one of those funny things where michael and i were at vidcon which is also just ironic timing because that's where all the big TikTokers and YouTube creators are. And, you know, I'm just like laying down and I'm like, man, this creating TikTok videos is a lot of work. And he's like, dude, you're going viral. And I like look at my like TikTok for our future finance and it's just blowing up. And I thought it was the funniest thing ever. I was like, that's crazy. So yeah, that was just kind of a fun thing. And then it was like, okay. This isn't going to make revenue for us in, in the short term, at least. So I need to go focus on the things that do. Yeah. I mean, something you just said there, making TikTok videos is hard. I think that was like <laughs> the biggest eye opener for me. Yeah. So my previous brands, they didn't need any social media presence. It was Twitter and Discord. That was it. Then I finally started that finance company with my best friend, a business partner of mine. And we started making videos on Instagram and we were like, how are we going to do this to like pop? And neither of us really want to show our face on this. It's kind of a discord business. Yeah. So squid games was popular. So we're like, you know what? Let's just throw that black squid games mask on and f film videos with just words above us and words around us. And we were posting three times a week and we're actually headed in the right direction. Like when I look back at the views, I'm like, I think we were right there and we, yeah. we, we quit. We gave up. And we we're like, you know what? Like we're not monetizing. We we built the business up to like 7,500 MRR and things were going great. And then we had the market start to dip really hard. People were like, oh my God, everything's selling off. So we just started to see a massive churn in our members. And I was like, you know what? This is really complicated. So we gave up. Now I'm building my thing. He has his cigar company that he's trying to put content online and we look back at that and we're like, I think we were right there. Like we started with nothing. We were, we went from getting like a hundred views on our reels to averaging 6,500 to 10 K per reel. And we just couldn't figure out how to monetize it. We couldn't transfer like those views into actual sales of the product. And I just have so much respect for people who have cracked that code. And I, I, I a hundred percent know why agencies exist because Man, it is a chore and it is really hard to make short form content that is really good. I think what I've realized now a little better is I just wanted to make the video and put it out there because I was like, I think it's going to do great. I think it's going to do great. But in reality, I spent an hour and 20 minutes and I thought I was going to get great results. But you should be putting a few hours into that video, scripting it, creating all these different aspects of it. And I look back now and I'm like, Man, so much respect for people like yourself and, and agency owners for building out these videos and these scripts because it's really hard. Like people think it's super simple to make this short form content on socials. It is not like it is really hard. So last kind of question I had for you here on the podcast front was if you had to start a podcast today, which you are, what advice would you give to somebody like me or, or somebody listening who's like, I, I want to get into podcasting. Like, let me give it a shot. So recognize first off that it is a multi-year play. This is yep. not thing where you're going to blow up in the first three months, four months, unless you somehow end up on Rogan or something like that. <laughs> right. Or you have a big personality or a lot of credibility to begin with. I think if it's one of those things where 
you already have a huge social following that you can leverage into a podcast, then it's a lot easier. What we tried to do in what we tried to do as we were building our future podcast now is we just thought about how is how can we take shortcuts? So what do I know that I can then funnel attention into? So what we under, understood is how to make viral clips. So we just leaned heavily into that and that's pushing over traffic to our podcast. But I think there's just two things that you can factor in when you're trying to grow a podcast. You, the, the way you get big is actually collaboration with other podcasts. So find out other podcasts in your niche and see if there's a way that you can cross collab, feature each other. Because what's nice is that if you can advertise or market to people who already listen to podcasts, you're actually reducing the friction. It's way easier to, to convert people who already listen versus trying to, tr trying to get people who don't even listen to podcasts and trying to grow market share that way. And then I think the second thing is just time. Like you just got to be consistent. You just have to focus on making sure you're just getting 1% better with each recording. And it doesn't have to be like massive improvements, just slight things that you can continue working on and then just letting time do its thing. It only takes, you know, one notable person listening to it to then share it to their audience. And then you start to blow up. Like the one person I think about in this context is Ben Wilson from How to Take Over the World because, you know, the dude was putting out amazing content. Like I, I love his podcast and I feel like where his inflection point was just getting shouted out on MFN right? Like that brought so much attention to his show. And I think David Senra from Founders had a very similar path as well, like just yep. grinded away, consistently put out content. Michael and I actually grabbed lunch with him in Miami. Nice. He just had so much energy and enthusiasm for what he was doing in that, and then, you know, one person happened to have listened to it was able to kind of change his entire trajectory. So I think it's just, Doing it long enough so you can put yourself in a position where you can get lucky. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I love that last line there was gold. And I think that's kind of what I'm going through right now. Like I've had my head down. I said, I'm going to start this. I'm going to, I'm going to build it. So head down. How can I get quality guests? I've, I think I've done a decent job at that. And then it's now, how can I get myself onto other podcasts and collab with other podcasts in the space who are doing a little bit of the same thing as me or in the same niche that I'm trying to target. And that is kind of the next step of the journey that I'm starting now. Like literally got back from vacation this week and I said, this is the next thing I need to do. I figured out how to acquire pretty good guests. I've figured out how to make the clips and, and do all that good stuff. Now I need to start putting myself out there. And that's the next part of my journey that I'm about to go on. So I'm super excited to start that. I mean, like I said, before we got online, I could talk to a wall. So I'm looking forward to hopefully getting on a lot of podcasts and getting to share my story. Because like I said, that was my biggest regret is that I never built a personal brand when I was doing these cool things that I did early on that gave me the ability to be here and do something like this. So I'm kind of on like my, my rebirth journey here, trying to put myself out there and I'm super excited about what's to come. And then I get it, the long game. I, I love investing. I'm super avid long-term investor. I think it's a great way to build a future. And what is it about? It's about time. Compound all of what you're doing throughout the young part of your life and see those gains later on. I think a podcast is the same way. You compound tons of amazing episodes. Like you said, one or two people shout you out, show you to their audience, put you on. And then it's just kind of like a domino effect. People are now looking through your old episodes, finding ones they like, sharing those out. And like you said, you really never know. And I think that's what I like about social media too that keeps me going. It's like, you like actually never know. I could wake up tomorrow and this podcast could have 20,000 subscribers and I wouldn't be able to do anything. Like it would just happen. And that's the power of social media. So that's what keeps me excited and going. Dude, I think you're gonna crush, man. Thank you, dude. Thank yeah. you. I mean, I'm really excited. This is, I mean, it finally feels like I found what I really wanted to do and what I was really excited about doing. And it probably took me about a year and a half of dragging my feet, trying little things here and there. So it tinker yeah. away. Yeah. yeah you got to tinker away. You got to try a bunch of things. And I think I've actually found like what is the next part of my journey. And I, I just like podcasts because it's something meaningful. Like 
I could stop podcasting in three years. Like, let's say it didn't blow up, but I recorded 300 episodes, built an amazing net worth. I mean, network of people, like maybe a good net worth too, but <laughs> an amazing network of people. Yeah, I could go back. I could be 50 years old and be like, look at this awesome like thing I built back then. Like, look at this archive of all of these memories and conversations right there. I was like, all right, this is invaluable. Like, this is something that I want to be able to like take with me down the road. So, I mean, a little riff about me here, but I'm super pumped. You've clearly motivated me here in this episode to get really excited. So thank you, man. It's that time. Simple last question of every episode. And it's Simi. What are you excited about in the near future? In the near future, I would say it's this podcast because it's something we wanted to do for a long time. And I feel like we've put ourselves in a good position to go do it. You know, we have the backing of a, a bigger media house behind us. We have built up some credibility that to the point where, you know, we can get most, but not all of the guests we would like to have. And now I would love to just watch us get better. I can even tell we're four episodes in and I can even notice us getting getting better just in, in the three or four th shows we've done so far. So, yeah, I mean, interested and excited to talk to even more people, getting to know their stories and getting to learn, most importantly, and then getting to riff on it with Michael. That's what I'm excited about. Yeah, I'm super excited for you both. I'm a subscriber, a listener, a fan. I think you guys are doing something amazing. I'm really excited to follow you on your Thanks. journey. Where can people find you? I want people to be able to interact with you and, and follow you on that journey that I'm following you on. So it's all going to be linked below, but I do cater to the people that are too lazy to read the beautiful descriptions that we write. So where's the best place for people to follow you? Perfect. So IG and Twitter, just very Gen Z here on IG. It's I'm dot Simi. And on Twitter, it is at underscore Simi underscore. Perfect. Yeah. Horrible username, I know, but <laughs> getting too deep now. I can't change it. It's all right. Somebody, I had somebody like, I think it's episode eight and he's built a huge following on Twitter through like writing content and he had to keep his old name and it's Steve on speed. And he's like, it's not the drug. Like it just couldn't change it. And I'm like, dude, it's unfortunate, but you got it's famous hilarious. with the wrong username, <laughs> Steve on speed. Tom, um, three, three, two, five, four, seven, right? Like anytime you yeah. get it. We're in your username, you're screwed. Like you're screwed. You're screwed. I just had to rework all my usernames. Like recently, I had to go out and find like ones because I mean, Andres Sanchez probably top ten most popular names in the United States and across the world. Yeah, there's yeah. not a lot of variations of that username that are still available. <laughs> but I, I got Andres Sanchez official on Instagram, which I thought was hilarious. Then nobody has taken that, even though it's a it's a mouthful. But Twitter doesn't let me get that far. I tried. They cut you off. Like it's too long. So they, now, right. so it's now official. And then Andres Sanchez. Maybe official Andres is like a bit yeah. that. Probably not, but I'll go check it out. Now it's underscore Andres underscore S A N C H <laughs> underscore. And that's the only thing I, I spent probably, I spent like too long to, to not be embarrassed just writing variations of my name yeah, on yeah. Twitter until I found one. But, Sammy, thank you so much for coming on the show, dude. This has probably been my favorite episode I've recorded so far. This was an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to continuing to stay connected, man. Yeah, man, same here. Thanks for having me. This is fun.